lot of stuff here to get to. Let so, I me mean, get out of the way and turn over to you guys. Recording in progress. I'm just going to give you a little prelude to something is for the new members that are joining I sat where you were 12 years ago and if you would have told me that I'd be giving lessons and wood turning and that I would be published and that I would have pieces that people look towards and stuff like that I would have told you you were crazy but it can happen because this club has so much talent and they were lucky enough to share it with me. Uh, Frank Jorgensen was probably the first guy uh, that started me off. Russ has tooled me, he was my mentor. I've learned stuff from Bill. Uh, Jim Weeks was another person that gave me so much inspiration and taught me different tool techniques. Uh, I've learned stuff from Scott. Uh, I would never expect to be where I'm standing today, 12 years ago when I first started turning. I started actually two years before that and I made a lot of mistakes and a lot of dangerous things that I did before I learned how to turn correctly. Uh, and it's a big difference between turning wood and being a wood turner. Uh, this past uh, couple of months ago, I went to the Flora Symposium and uh, I happened to have, I was lucky enough to uh, spend four days with David Ellsworth there. I took his lessons and I, luckily I had lunch two days with him just by chance. He just happened to sit down with me and the stuff that I learned during lunch was amazing. The classes that I took were amazing. I highly suggest if you ever go to ch get a chance to go to the Flora Symposium. Uh, I took five classes on Friday, five classes on Saturday and two on Sunday and the classes were amazing and some of the people were just so giving of themselves it was a great experience for me but uh, going into wood turning the more you little secrets that you learn and the more things that you have makes your life so much easier uh, you can go from being a wood turner and sanding half your life away or you could be a wood turner and hardly touch a piece of sandpaper when you literally learn how to sharpen your tools, use the right tools, uh, know how to sharpen them, know the tricks to it. It's not hard, it just has to be extremely repetitive. You have to be able to sharpen something exactly the same way every time. It's not something where you're taking a guess, oh yeah, that looks good on the grinder. No, you should be able to repeat the angle that you're doing every single time without taking measurements and all that stuff. It's very easy. Uh, Russ has a great selection of tools here. And a uh, matter of fact, when I'm going to... When we get into talking about the gouges, we'll talk about... I'll hand out some, uh, some sheets on uh, sharpening the different angles and stuff like that. By the way, the patch on Charlie's uh, jacket is from his club in Long Island, and he's um, spearheaded an effort to, and we're going to do it, get our own patches that they're iron on. So we'll have those available sometime in the near future, and you just buy the patch and put it on any shirt you want. So it's sort of a, we're copying them, but we thought it was a good idea. Uh, these are different, ang different angles for different gouges. Uh, I came away after the Florida Symposium with a completely different attitude after speaking to uh, David Ellsworth. Um, what he talks about, and I, I bought his Bible, so to speak, he, they call him the grandfather of wood turning. Uh, he's 88 years old, and there's been 27 symposiums. He's been at all 27 of them. Uh, he, he's amazing what he does. The thing that, the first thing that, that somebody would recognize from him, he sharpens his tools, I'm going to say every three minutes, which is probably the number one mistake that wood turners make. 
they think their tool is sharp, but it doesn't. And everybody knows whether you're shaving your legs or you're shaving your beard. You're not going to use this ten times. You're going to throw it away. And you don't have ten million pores in your face. You just have little hairs, and there's a stainless steel blade in here, and your face isn't spinning at 1600 RPM. So just think about your tools. They're not stainless steel. They're softer than stainless steel, but they're going at 1600 RPM. So when you're sharpening something, where's my other thing? I want everybody to think of one thing when they're using a tool and when they're sharpening a tool. I want them to think of a bunch of straws. These are the fibers that are in the wood. Okay, if you have a tool and you're going into the fibers, they're not moving. But if you're going into the wood and it's unsupported, it moves. So that's when you're going into a bowl with a tool. If you're coming out of a tool, you're coming out into air. So the fibers, these fibers, are not supported. So you're gonna, it's going to be rough. No matter how sharp that tool is, it's going to be rougher than if you go in because there's a fiber behind the fiber when you're pushing down into here. This, the opposite on the way here. When you're coming into the bowl, it's being supported by the fibers down here. When you're coming up, you're coming out into air. So what happens is when you're coming out into air, the fibers separate. When you're going into them, they're stuck and they get cut smooth. The tools that you use, you have to think of the fibers. That's whether you're doing end grain or side grain. If you're going to do a, a wand, if I'm going this way, the grain is going that way, and it's going to be a smooth cut. If I come back this way, I'm going against the grain, and it's going to be much rougher. So thinking about the fibers that the piece of wood is made out of, whether the fibers are going this way or the fibers are going this way, how are you going to stop tear out is depending on how you hit those fibers. There's different tricks that you can do to prevent this. Sometimes you can put, uh, spray it with a bottle of water and the fibers are a little softer. Sometimes they'll cut a little nicer, but I always remember somebody showed me a bundle of straws and whenever I cut something or whenever I'm sharpening something and I'm using a tool, I'm thinking about those fibers. How, am I, how is my tool approaching those fibers. <clears throat> so, Charlie, is it a visual? Is what? It, is it a visual? How do you know which way the fibers are? You can look at the wood pretty much. You can see the grain in the wood here? Yeah. It, the fibers are going this way. And if you look at it, if they're going this way, this is end grain, mm -hmm. this is end grain, this is side grain, this is side grain. So it, the wood will tell you that. And you can actually feel you could feel the, I'll even pass this around, you could feel the end grain is rough and the side grain is smooth. Uh, this is a, a plate that I made for the thing, I, I tapped it, and I make many of these and I do, I'll, you'll see some of the things that I make out. But you could feel the end grain is different, I mean, pass it around, you could very easily see that. <coughs> but when you're sharpening your tools, I don't know if everybody knows, uses one of these when they sharpen their tools, but it's very easy to... Uh, where is my gouge? I must have left it in the car. Okay. <clears throat> David Ellsworth said, you should be able to repeat what you're doing blindfolded. So if I'm going to sharpen this, I'm going to stick it in here, and it, I want the same exact distance every single time. So this hole in this thing is two inches deep. I put that there. I tighten this. I know that that's two inches. I don't have to measure it to make it tight enough. I'm 
I know that that's two inches. There's nothing, and I, I always put a penny in the bottom of this so that I don't keep making the bottom of it deeper and deeper. Okay, so it's two inches. I know it's dead. Then this goes into a this goes into a holder. Everybody have seen these? They go into a holder, and this goes in here, and you rotate your thing. The thing is that this is an accurate. You can look at it, you can put marks on it, but it's not 100% accurate. It might be 98%, it might be 95%. But you can make it accurate every single time without even using a ruler. Once you get your angle you want, you cut blocks and put the num angle on them. You put them against the bottom of this, and you run them against the bottom of the holder. That is exactly where it was the last time. If I want 45, I don't have to take anything out. I put this against here, run it to here, it's done. I'm at 45 degrees. I can do any angle with these blocks. And I know when I go to the grinder, I'm going to duplicate that angle exactly the way it's supposed to be done. The one, what I want. To set some of the angles up on, 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 your, on to make sure you have the right angle, I'll always check it with something like this. but. Once I use those blocks, every time I use something like an angle checker. The, uh, the guide that you have there has a lever that you tighten. Yes. I find that when I pull that lever and tighten, it slides that. But not if you keep the block there and okay. push against it, it's going to stay there. So I need to make blocks because it's okay. moving on me. And you'll get the same thing every single time. Also, your grinder shouldn't be up here. Your grinder should be down here, your belt or a little bit lower, and you should be looking over it. Not looking at the side like this, but looking over the top of it. You should have a light on it. There should be some kind of light. But you should be able to see the tip gets turned very quickly. It's the edges that you work. Um, and you know, obviously, get, always have glasses. Always wear sunglasses. I mean, uh, safety glasses. If you want, you can go out and spend, which is a total waste of money. You can buy a gauge for every single angle that you want. It's not needed. Because once you set the, your angle up, once with something like this, and you use the block, you never have to check it again. It's like always the same thing. What? When do you get that? This I got <laughs> on uh, uh, Amazon. I think they were eight bucks. Stainless steel. It's an they angle. They have gauge. that Harbor Freight. And the other thing that I do is I always keep this in my pocket. And I, David Ellsworth is, is the one that also stated this to me. But you don't always have to re-grind your tips. Sometimes all you need to do is to have a little diamond bone. Sometimes you can just take take your thing and just go like this. And that will do it. That little bit of action will bring that edge back. Depends on how much, how bad you use it. But you have to get in the habit of sharpening your tools more often. Should you take that little diamond card, epoxy a magnet, somewhere handy on your lady, you can always just grab yep. it. That's, that's true. That's Absolutely. The Absolutely. There's a magnet yeah. right there. That's a, see? It, it works great. If you uh, if you went back to the grinder every time and you sharpened as often as David Ellsworth, your tools would wear out very quickly. So it's really important to learn how to um, hone that edge. It's really not a grind. It's just honing um, uh, to keep the, the amount of material that you're removing to a minimum. But still getting the keen edge. Uh, there's a difference between the different tools and what grind you should be using for the tools. If you're using a negative break scraper, or you're using a skew, um, or if you're using a parting tool, you don't want burrs on it because that's going to damage your wood. It's going to leave marks on your wood. You want to use a fine type of grind, whether you're using aluminum oxide wheels or I happen to use CBN wheels. You want something for a tool that's going to be doing finishing work, like, like a skew, something like that. 
that you want something that's 220, 320, something like that. But if you're using a gouge like this, okay, if you're using a gouge like this, or you're using something like this, you're not necessarily worried. You're not finishing your job with this. You're, you're just getting into to, to a shape that you want it. You don't mind if there's a burr on it because the burr is just going to help you remove more wood quicker and it's a quick sharpen. But there's a difference between a sharp tool with a smooth grind and a sharp with, with burrs on it. What it does to your work. Both tools have their uses. If I'm doing a, a detail gouge, like this, I want this sharp. I do not want burrs on the end of it. Because I'm going to be making finials. I'm going to be doing something fine with this. I might be coming along the, the outside of a bowl to, to do a, uh, a, a pull cut to get it nice and smooth. Uh, so I want sharp. I don't want something with burrs on it. But then you take a tool, a gouge yeah. off the grinding wheel where you just sharpen it. Uh, there will be a, a very fine burr on it, but the minute it touches the wood, uh, that burr is really essentially gone. So it, it's irrelevant. Some people go to a lot of trouble to hone uh, a gouge after they've sharpened it. It's, it's really not necessary. And in fact, it's very easy if you run a hone across that you make it less sharp. So just leave it alone. The wood will take care of it. Uh, before we get into different ways of chucking your stuff, uh, the only tool that I have, that this was a, uh, originally a, uh, a round nose scraper, and what I did was when, when you're making something on a, on a link and you have, you have a piece here and you want it, the piece is here, it's hard to get in there to make a tenon with your tool. But if you make a tenon tool, and I can pass this around, I can have this. Well, that's short. <laughs> I can take this and go right into the side and I can make a tenon with this tool, with this in place. So it doesn't bother me. That, that's one of the things. Now, the, the guy that's taught me more about tools than anything, I'm going to turn it over to Russ to talk about the tools themselves. I mean, he's a wizard on it. And he's one of my mentors, so... Uh, I'll let him take gold to start talking about the tools. All right. Um, we'll, we'll back up a little bit. Uh, we'll get into the tools in just a second. We'll talk about sort of two phases of chucking. The first one is when you take just your raw piece of wood like this, and we covered this pretty well in the classes that we did. I'll just go over it real quickly. Uh, how do you get from this point to this point where you've got a tenon and you're ready to put it uh, in the chuck? So phase one of, of chucking, many ways to do it. Um, the way I taught in the uh, last two uh, workshops was to use a big bike. The big bike goes in the chuck. These will fit in a, a lot of different chucks. They're made by one way, but uh, I know they'll go in uh, Nova chucks. And you prefer that chuck? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mean uh, th this chuck or the big bite? The big bite. Yeah, uh, I do. Uh, it's a very positive way of gripping it. Um, a disadvantage is that if you do have a catch, uh, it's it's less likely to, to run free. If you use uh, a spur drive like this, um, which I brought another blank anyway. This, oh, uh, if the use a spur drive, uh, it will slip when you have a catch. But uh, generally, if you have a, a catch with a big bite, it's uh, it's also uh, going to slip enough, so it won't be a problem. I'm not going to do any of this. I'd be happy to demonstrate if you want. I'm just going to go through real quickly the different ways to hold the piece uh, to make the tenon, and then we'll we'll talk about actual chucking. So. It goes on like this, you bring the tailstock up, uh, then you kind of 
put a lot of pressure on it so the teeth and the big bite are grabbing the stock. Uh, and then you can go ahead and shape the outside, put the tenon on it. If you've made a, a tenon tool like this, you're ahead of the game, but you can make tenons with a parting tool or with a, um, a spindle gouge as well. Uh, other ways, uh, if you don't want to invest in a big bite, they're only around 20 probably more like $25. There are a bunch of different ways. Uh, you can use uh, a screw chuck, uh, which this fits into, the, um, into your scroll chuck. Um, I really don't recommend this uh, because it holds the piece so rigidly that you cannot make adjustments to line up the grain. And that's one of the advantages of this is if you are exposing the heart, uh, heartwood uh, and the sapwood, which you will be, and you, it's a little out of balance, you can move this around a little to get the thing uh, balanced better. <clears throat> Same with the uh, spur guy. So I think I would recommend, if you're just setting up your shop now, I would recommend the big bite or the spur driver, or better yet, uh, both. Uh, and that gives you much more latitude. Um, there's a place for these, and uh, uh, it's, it's just another way, and uh, Charlie's got two other kinds of these spur drives. These are screw there. chucks. They just screw into the wood. You drill a hole that's smaller than this, and you, you screw your piece onto here. This is for bigger pieces, and this is even for bigger, and there's basically three different types of uh, jaws that you have on chucks. You have a two-jaw truck chuck, which is something like this. Only two jaws, and it's great for holding something square. You have three-jaw chucks, which is sometimes a drill chuck. And then you have all different types of four-jaw chucks. Each one has its own different thing. The, you take these plates off, you take these jaws off, and that will hold this screw chuck down in there without these on there. If you're gonna buy chucks, one of the things if you're starting out, I highly recommend instead of buying, chucks are expensive, instead of buying, trying to buy six or seven chucks, what you can do is you can buy a chuck kit. And when you buy a chuck kit, they come with all different size jaws. And at least when you start, you can grab all different ways, inside, outside, um, wider, like um, the one that he has in, on here. He's got bigger jaws on here, uh, on that one. Uh, the different chucks can be very expensive. This kind of chuck, opens and closes with two pins that you pull, pull and it spins open. It, it, it's, it's okay, but it's not as good as one that has, that opens and closes like this. Like this. <coughs> this is a much better chuck. I happen to like the long jaws on most of my chucks because it keeps me away from the chuck when I'm working. Uh, I can get behind my work to finish and sand it. And I like being away from the headstock a little bit. I love these jaws, I, the ones I, that I use the most. Then you have Vicmark chuck. I don't know if you have a Vicmark chuck here, no, but they, I have all, uh, one they're one. fantastic. They're one of the most expensive, but there's an Allen key that you use to tighten them. They're really the top of the line, Vicmark chucks. Uh, naturally, the, the ones that spin are less expensive than the ones with a chuck key. And then we have another type of chuck called soft jaws. And these are rubber tips. And these open and close to hold. If you have something like this and you want something a little bigger than this, but. These are adjustable. You have to take all of these out and put them in different holes to hold your stuff. But these are called soft jaws. And this is for slow RPM, not high RPM. When I say you don't want to go over 800 RPM with this. And I always, always use the tail stock to come up with it. And the tail stock can come up with it. If this is my tail stock, 
it can come up a bunch of different ways. If I don't want to leave any marks, this is a hockey ball, field hockey. I drilled a hole in it. This gets pushed against my work, it's not going to leave any marks. You can also go to the dollar store, pay a dollar for a hard rubber ball, and it works beautifully. To Golf to ball, if something that. small. Anything so it doesn't mar the work. Fits on the end. Uh, later in the program, I'll, I'll show you how to make your own um, soft jaws. You don't have to. Uh, you buy can make it out of wood if you want. <clears throat> that when you buy this, that comes with the pin, this, and it comes with a small cone or a large cone. And there's a pin that goes in here, and this screws on, and this would be your piece that that would be spinning. But what you can do, what most people don't realize. You can take this and reverse it the other way. And if you're making a platter, then you could take a piece of foam rubber and use this and push this against your work. And it'll hold that platter nice and tight without making any marks on it. If you want to know what this is, for a dollar at a garage sale, this is the swimmy things that the kids use to kick, kick. I cut it up and I use it for my donut chuck, which I'll explain later. And I use it to make pads for pieces. When I'm, if I want to turn something like this, I would put this in here and bring my this up into here. Or this is a sanding disc. Without the sand on it, I could put this in a... Uh, chuck that has that, that's free spinning and I could put this in here and I could bring this up and hold it in There's, they they sell chucks that have that are spinning this one's not spinning but those are some of the chucks that are available Russ has a, a good selection there a real good selection go ahead Russ um, as you get into wood turning more and more, you will realize that we, we can find all kinds of reasons to spend money. And uh, uh, I'm lazy, so I don't like to take the time to change the jaws in one chuck. So I have six uh, strong old chucks. When I first started turning, I bought one a year. They were back then about $200. Uh, I managed to rationalize that. Uh, so I keep my small, these are number one spigot jaws in this one. Uh, the number twos are this size, and the number threes are this size. So, and all my chucks are right uh, to, in front of the lathe. I can switch from one to another very quickly, uh, and I'll talk about the different, uh, the uses of the, the different types of jaws. But uh, over time, that really is the way to go. And you can buy them uh, at used tool sales. You don't have to go to a catalog and buy new every time, but just pick them up uh, when you find them. And uh, you should at least have uh, a number two, which is pretty much uh, will cover most of the bowls that you're doing, and then a number three for a larger piece. Um, you've heard, the, uh, heard us talk about uh, dovetail jaws and regular straight, uh, they're serrated jaws with little, little grooves on them. Generally, you use the straight jaws for um, side grain bowls, uh, and then you use the um, dovetail jaws for um, spindle work. Uh, and the reason is that these will grip securely going all the way around. Uh, if you try to use this on a side grain bowl, because of the angle of the jaw, you run a little bit of a risk of uh, actually breaking the, the uh, tenon off if you have a catch, uh, because that's uh, putting a lot of force uh, on the grain, on the side grain, not on the end grain. So keep this for, if you're only going to buy one, definitely get the, uh, the straight serrated jaws and get, get the number two. If you can find a kit like that with multiple jaws, then you're ahead of the game. Uh, it does take a little time to change them. You can put an Allen wrench in a little drill and you can pull these screws out in no time. So it really is not that big a deal. As I said, I'm just lazy. Um, so hey, Russ, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember what chuck I've got, but it, it's gear driven. 
to make the adjustments. Yeah. And it's probably gummed up inside. What's a good way to clean the chuck? Uh, I would get some um, uh, lacquer thinner. What would you Brent say? Cleaner. A brick cleaner? Oh, okay. Um, any any uh, really strong solvent and soak the whole thing right in it. Just the whole thing. Uh, yep, throw it in. I did that to, again because I'm lazy. Uh, I'll, I frequently apply finishes when the piece is turning slowly. Well, you're going to get overspray if you're spraying, and even if you're not spraying, eventually your chucks get all cracked up. And uh, so a few months ago, I decided it was time to clean house. I got some lacquer thinner, but any kind of strong uh, solvent, and I put each chuck in uh, a bucket of uh, lacquer thinner for about an hour. It softened all that gunk up, up, and I blew it out with a compressed uh, air nozzle, and then uh, sprayed some lube in there, and they, they're just like new. So, so, so Russ, you didn't bother to take the chuck apart, can you? you just no, you don't have to. Right in yep. and let it give it some yeah, time. the tolerances are loose enough, so the, the fluid will get in there. Uh, and, and loosen it all up. And also, if you've got uh, some on the bed of your lathe, uh, it's wonderful stuff for just cleaning up um, solidified crap that you uh, haven't, haven't cleaned up before. Uh, but that's a good way to do it. And then for a lube, uh, silicone will work, but you can get a spray uh, lithium grease that's better. Silicone isn't good around your, your pieces because it can interfere with the finish. Uh, Bill. <coughs> I used to be at Sun and Fun, and twice a year we'd take all the chucks out because they just got abused and took them all apart and put them in the uh, brake cleaner yep. to soak them, wire brush them, clean, and then put them back together. When you put the one way chucks back together, <coughs> you've got to go in order to get it back. You gotta start with number one, go to number two and three and four so it all picks up. Uh, we had some people that thought they knew what they were doing. They got them all screwed up and then they didn't come together. Right? I'll let them that. What he's talking about is these jaws have numbers on them. I'll pass these around. You'll see there's numbers one through four. There's spots on the chuck where one through four go, and that's the only spots they can go for. You can pass it around, and you'll see the numbers on it. Uh, it and I would just say that once you've taken it apart, it's really no big deal. And if you know you take it apart, you clean it like wire brush it, or you know I use that grease uh, grease release or gum release that I bought at the auto parts store, and I mean it take 15, 20 minutes. And it's like new when you go. Charlie, where are the marks on the chuck? No, the chucks on itself are underneath the piece. If I took that off, you'd see number one there. Oh, uh, and actually, this one here has it on the end. Yeah, it's one, very clear. two, three, four. Right there. But some of them have it underneath the chuck. Okay, I've seen it on the jaws, but I've not seen it on my chuck. Yeah. Yeah, um, the um, one ways don't have a, a number on the base of the chuck. It's just in the in the um, piece that holds the jaw, mm -hmm. and um, so where you start doesn't matter with a one way, but you do have to do it in sequence. Even these had the numbers on one, two, three, four, and underneath they had mm -hmm. one, two, three, and four on them. Right. Again, if it's a cross grain or side grain, you want. Straight jaws. Yeah. You can you use the dovetail? Yes, yeah, you can. It's just a little. There's risky. a little more risk in. Uh, you always want to clamp it down um, and, and check that uh, tightness of your jaws throughout the turning process because the vibration does loosen it up. Uh, there's a slight risk of having that uh, clamp so hard that it actually breaks the pattern off. Okay. So then, if you're just buying one set for to start with, you get uh, get the straight jaws. And then, uh, the, it, what is stronger or safer to hold, a tenon or a mortise? Uh, well, uh, I put the pictures the of the piece. tenons over there. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, for most of your work, if it's green, you're going to want to go with the tenon, uh, with the outside. This is called a recess, and there are times that I will use a recess, but it's usually on bigger pieces. 
uh, where I don't want that tenon in the middle, like if I'm making a platter and I have a lot of wood. The problem with um, expanding the jaws, which is what you're doing, here you're tightening the jaws. Um, if it's green wood, you can actually break the wood right here. Uh, so if the, if the piece is dry, you can crank on it really hard. But um, I, would, I would use a tenon for most bowl work and then uh, use the uh, recess for larger pieces. That's if if you put that, too much pressure on this that's and it's not point. good hard wood, I could use a Norfolk Island pine, that'll crack right there. That's with any wood. But you the don't what? have to crank it up. <laughs> this one here holds better than this does. Oh, it does? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Then, but if you're using the tenon, you need to make it match your chuck. If you've got uh, if you've got the undercut chucks, you've got to cut uh, you've got to cut an undercut tenon. Yeah. If you've got a parallel chuck, then you cut parallel wall. Right. Don't, don't undercut it for a parallel wall. Um, when in my classes, I tell people when they're making a tenon and they're going to use straight jaws to put about a two degree undercut on it. Uh, so it is grabbing a little more securely, but it, it needs to be straight and where it meets the bowl, it needs to be really 90 degrees. Uh, if it isn't and those jaws are not sitting flat on the bowl, uh, you're not gonna be able to, it will wobble and you won't be able to repeat. And when I say repeat, there will be uh, times when you wanna take your your bowl off, set it aside, particularly if you're going to do a twice turn bowl, you throw it in the corner for two or three months. When you put it in initially, and I always do this with the number one jaw, I just make uh, a pencil mark right on each side of the, or a sharpie, right on each side of the number one jaw. So when you remount it, uh, it, will, it will always be in the same place. And yeah. otherwise, can I? Yeah. When you do what you just said, if that's a green piece of wood, you take it off and double turn it. When you come back, that tenon won't be rounded. That's true. You will. You will. Uh, you will have to uh, re true the tenon up. Uh, but if you're if you're going back and forth during the process. And you want to put it in the same place. Just, just have those marks to, to guide you. Yeah. If you want to make tendon, uh, make chucks for different things, this is just a regular chuck that uh, drill chuck that goes into number two mortise here. If you're making a bottle stopper, all of this is is basically this is a it's a three eight bolt. This is a piece of wood that I cap for 3 8 and the bottle stop that goes in there is also uh, 3 8 tap. So this is already tapped to receive the bottle stop. stop. Uh, you can just, I, I capped it, put CA glue on it, threaded it on it, and then I bring up the nut just to jam it and make it tight. Put this in a chuck, and I can spin this and make a bottle top, and then put the stopper actually right in there. It's all done. That's one way of doing it. But the other way is you could do it on a block of wood like this. You can open this up, and you could this 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 I I, I use a tremendous amount of times for pens. It's got two jaws on it. It'll hold anything that's square or rectangle. But when I put this on the lathe, when this spins, I know exactly where the center is. And when I want to get a piece of wood drilled perfectly so I can put it on my mandrel to make a pen, I know that that hole is going to be perfect with that chuck holding that piece. This is going to be perfect. Now this is the next thing that you use for making pens. It's a mandrel chuck. This goes in the headstock, this goes in the tailstock, this spins. And now when this spins, I can make the pen that I want, whatever the body, whatever shape that I want. 
The other thing that you can do is, I use these sometimes when I'm making pepper mills, is you can use these rubber chucks, expanding chucks. You drill a hole for whatever size these are, or you can put this tape, I put duct tape around it because I, I didn't have the exact size. But you tighten this nut in the back, and these expand. And they'll hold whatever size hold you want, depending on what size. And they sell these in sets, these rubber chucks. And they're very useful uh, for holding different things. Um, and the last, the other one is the vacuum chucks. This is a machine board vacuum head. This goes through the machine and your hose just goes right on the end of this piece of metal. I don't particularly like this one. This is a better um, thing. You take this off. You stick it through. This one's not long enough, but you screw this in and it has a rubber gasket on it. That gasket sits on the inside of this ridge. The hose hooks up right here. You can also make your own vacuum chucks out of plywood and foam rubber. Uh, Here's two homemade ones with the same piece of foam rubber that I did. I like it because it's closed cell foam, not open cell. That means air won't go through it. I've glued this to the ridge, and now when I suck something onto there and it sucks in, it stays in and it doesn't move. Uh, I use these things quite, the, and this is just PV, two different size PVC pipes with two pieces of wood. You can make them to any size you want. Uh, you thread them for what size spindle you have, which size here. The, I have inch and a quarter by eight, and that's the spindle that taps the, all these plates, all my chucks. Then if you really want to get cheap, and I, I started doing this when I first started turning, I didn't have any chucks. I made chucks. I had one of... I wanted to hold something, I'll make believe this is all the way in. You can glue something on here and make what's called a paper chuck. It's a brown paper bag, just like this. Make sure it's single layer, but thick paper. You just cut it, glue this half to here and this half to here. Put some weight on it and let it go. When you want to, I don't know if I'll be able to do it because I didn't bring a hammer. But if I wanted to split this, I want to take that off. You can see how that paper is holding. Now the only thing I have to do is remove the paper either by sanding it or wetting it and pulling it off. But that's a glue chuck. And they're the cheapest ones. You can get brown paper bags for nothing. That's the cheapest chuck you can make. Um, the other chuck, for holding things that are not particularly something like this or something like this, if you want to hold it and it's, it's in an odd shape, you can have what's called a donut chuck. This is a donut chuck. It's just a flat piece of wood with holes drilled on it. I have a piece here that's threaded. And this would go down and hold any shape. I just have the ball in there to show you that it'll hold the ball. And then you tighten these nuts and it'll hold anything you want in any shape, any size. And depending on how long these screws are, is depending on how big it is. If you're going to make one, make sure you use acorn nuts on the top. Because if you're wearing a smock and it's baggy, <laughs> you don't want to catch it on this end. This won't catch it. So how and do you turn it with, those, with, the, with these guys in the way? Turn the end. Hmm? 
Uh, you start on the bottom. Well, you, you turn. You, or you, you would have it in, in something that would be sticking out. Like in other words, if I wanted to put this there and I'm working on this, I could turn that. But you could hold anything of any size with this. And if you need to, you can make this bigger, you can make it smaller. But this is called the donut chuck for holding, especially long things that, that you want to hold. But I like to make use of everything. So if I don't use this as a donut chuck, I, can, I have a hole drilled in the center. I can use this as a screw chuck. Just by taking a wood screw, putting it through there, take these off, and now I have just a flat platter with the screw on it. But what do you what do what do you see underneath there? I also use this as a sanding disc. I have a piece of sandpaper glued to that, so I can take this off and use it. And I can make a sanding disc any size I want. You don't need a disc sander. I can make one just by doing this. So this one chuck can do a couple of different things that it cost me nothing to make. Uh, Charlie can be really cheap sometimes and he likes to make his own. You can also go out and buy uh, uh, chucks for bottle stoppers. This is, uh, comes with a one by eight thread. This is an adapter to go on the one way. Uh, this is the same thing, but it actually goes in the number two Morse taper. Obviously, you gotta pay a little money for these. They're not super expensive. You can also make your own. Um, kind of a, a corollary to uh, Charlie's donut chuck. These are called cup centers. Uh, first of all, this is called a tailstock adapter. And if you don't have one, go out and get one. Because as you do more different different kinds of work and you're doing what we call reverse chucking, and we can, we can cover that, uh, uh, you're gonna wanna take your, your piece and uh, flip it around and uh, mount it on the tailstock and bring it up to whatever your vacuum chuck or some other uh, thing, maybe your, your uh, coal jaws or something uh, to hold it. This will, is something that I use probably five times a day when I'm working in my shop for one thing or another. So do, do get that. Uh, another way, this is a variation on the donut chuck. It's a way to make uh, uh, round balls, which I make them out of uh, resin. And yes, this holds the ball like that. And you turn it a little bit, uh, and then um, loosen the chuck up, turn it a little more, turn away your pencil marks, and eventually you end up with a round piece. Uh, it's, it's a little tricky at first. You can make these any size you want, uh, and it's uh, a, a great way to hold it. Um, without the uh, larger apparatus to, to get in the way. Um, lots, of, lots of good videos on uh, doing all this stuff on YouTube, obviously. Uh, we'll talk a little more about chucking and then we'll get into the tools. This is called the safe drive. If you're beginning at wood turning, it's, it's a very good way of chucking things for doing spindles. Um, oh, this is number three. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, <coughs> okay. If you're making spindles, the safe drive is a very thing. If you're worried about catches or you're going to get something, uh, uh, you're using a tool for the first time and you're not sure how it's going to act. It's a very safe way of doing it. Because if you get a jam, this spins, this spins, and this don't, and you don't get anything. I was very fearful of a tool when I first started. I didn't use it probably for four or five years until I met somebody by the name of Nick Cook. And Nick Cook took a log that was this big and about this round, and in about 45 minutes, he made the most beautiful lamp base I ever saw in my life. It was amazing. 
absolutely amazing. He used one tool for the whole entire thing. He used a skew. And it was a tool that I was afraid of. So a skew has real sharp edges on it. And you'll be happier with that one. Yes. Uh, if you went into the wood like this, you'd, be, you'd get a real bad catch. It's not for going into the wood like this, and it's not for being on center like most of our tools are on center. When you use a school skew, you want to be... This one was long enough. That's the only one we have. That's the only one now. Wasn't there another one in there before? Uh, Look, there was another one in there. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to have to make believe that this is longer. <laughs> the skew, I'll, I'll do it out here, doesn't come into the tool like this. The skew comes into the tool like this and above center. I need to move your right hand. I can't see the end of it. Okay. okay. The skew doesn't come in like this. It comes in like this. Above center. You lay the tool down and you lift the handle slowly and then you slide across it. There's only an eighth of an inch that's doing the cutting. And what's nice about a skew, you've got such a, this, this one's like a one inch skew. You have a whole bunch of eighth of an inches here. So you can always go back to a very sharp edge. And you use it in this motion, or you use it in this motion. Above center. You don't want to hit center. It'll, you'll get a catch. And since I've taken a class from Nick Cook, I use this a lot on spin, basically use the spindle. You don't use this inside a bowl. You could use it on the outside to make a shear cut, but basically it's the spindle work. But he made the most beautiful table lamp just using one tool. And if it's sharp enough, and he sharp, another guy that sharpened his tools every five minutes, absolutely zero sanding. Zero. Alan Lacer is a name that um, some of you may recognize. He's been around the AAW for years. He is really uh, the acknowledged master of the SKU. Uh, he uses a little bit bigger one that has a profile a little more like uh, this uh, scraper where it's uh, sharpened on a little bit of a curve and he can make tops that are a quarter of an inch. Uh, using a tool this size. Uh, it's just amazing, and, and as Charlie said, it's a finishing tool in the right hands. Uh, it's also a roughing tool. Uh, it really, it's a tool that most of us are scared of. Uh, and Frank always says it's a wonderful tool, but not one to use in a demo. Uh, you really, <laughs> the chances of a catch are a little higher, but once you, once you become familiar with the tool, it's very safe, and you will not have a catch. You can do amazing things uh, with this. Then the, uh, the other type of chuck, and I'll, I'll pass this around. If anybody is interested in making wooden rings, I've made quite a few of them, but there's a special chuck. It's called a ring chuck. And I think uh, Craft Supply or Pen Craft sells it. And the other chuck we haven't talked about yet is just taking, and Russ is great at the other, the other end of this, you just get a, a flat board. What a, you can either make a, make a chuck on it, uh, make, thread a piece, or you can put a, a um, face plate on it. It's a duct tape, I mean a double back tape chuck. But it's not your normal double back tape. Do not go to Home Depot and buy double back tape unless you happen to be in the carpeting department. Their double back tape is pressure sensitive. This is pressure Now to show you the difference, if you buy a double back tape at Home Depot or Lowe's in the regular hardware department, it's gonna cost you $8 for a roll like this. This roll costs $35. It adds to whatever pressure you put on it, it adds to it and it's very hard to get off. It holds very well. So that is a, a chucking method if you have something that, especially like if you're doing a platter and you don't want to, 
you can't get a chuck onto it, or you don't have a vacuum chuck to hold it. Duct tape will hold it, and then you just have to be careful prying it off. Uh, but Russ taught me the way to use a glue gun, and he's amazing. I'll let him talk about that. Um, I took a class with Malcolm Tibbetts quite a few years ago, and I was amazed at how much he uses uh, uh, hot melt glue to hold pieces temporarily. Um, and I do it as well, and there are a lot of times when you can not use any other chucking method. You really have to create your own, and that's the case with this, which has, uh, you can't really see it, but there's a, uh, uh, on the top there, there's a little bit of a neck, and the neck is off center. So I had to put blocks in there, and then screw these uh, blocks with a little bit of a, of a angle on them to hold the piece in place, um, and then um, screw them down, and then use a little hot melt glue. So now I have a piece, uh, and it's, I really did it so I could uh, make the feet on the bottom. When I set this up, it still had a tenon on it. Uh, so to do the rest of this finishing on this piece, this was the way I did it. And uh, you'll find as you do more and more work, uh, you're going to have to create uh, chucks for uh, special applications. This is going to be an incredibly handy tool. That, so add it to your inventory right away. Probably you all have one anyway. That table lamp that Nick Cook made, that's it. Oh. Russ, is, yeah. there, is there a big difference between Michael's and he only was one tool, only tool no sanding, or like a grizzly glue stick as far as the adhesion goes? Um, you know, I am not sure about that. I know that there are different heat uh, heat ranges yeah. for glue, and some are, uh, require a much hotter, higher quality uh, heat gun. The ones, the little small ones, you get like at Michael's Crafts, and they're for making um, Christmas wreaths uh, and things where you don't need really much holding power. Those would not be comparable to this. This is fairly heavy duty, uh, and it's a and it's a heavier duty glue. So you're screwing your little squares on. And then in hot gluing them first, uh, I thought you had screwed them on. No, they, I screw them onto the plate, to the, yes, the big backer plate. plate. Uh, and so they're making contact uh, with the piece. And that, that should be by itself enough. So the hot melt glue in that situation is just a little bit of insurance. So the piece can't move in any way so in the jaws. So you do put it underneath before you screw it on? No. 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 On, oh, this, you glue the seam. on this particular one, the only place that has glue is right here. And that's really to, to be sure the bowl doesn't turn in oh. this. This is a homemade chuck. And just to be sure that this bowl uh, doesn't rotate on me. And then how do you get the glue off? Okay, good question. Um, if you're putting glue on raw wood, uh, glue can, uh, hot melt glue can be dissolved with denatured alcohol. It works fairly well. But if you're on raw wood, don't use alcohol because you will get some down into the fibers of the wood that will be, you'll have a, a heck of a time getting it out. So if you're, if, if it's best to use it on a surface that already has some finish on it, even if it's only sanding sealer. But if you can't do that, use a um, razor knife or a cabinet scraper and very carefully clean it off that way. Uh, and be careful with those knives. Uh, the the uh, uh, utility knives. Uh, I got a nasty, a nasty cut with one two hours before I was doing a demo for a club up in in uh, in Central Florida, and uh, so I gave the safety lecture that night. <laughs> so be careful. Do you have blocks underneath that too? Just yes. Else, get them underneath. I did on this. Normally I wouldn't, but because I already have the the. Uh, Oh, there, there's a neck in there, okay. uh, so I had to elevate the piece above uh, that level. Will, will the heat gun be hot enough to melt the glue? Um, yes. Uh, no, the, the heating element is inside the gun. So the tip, even though it's fairly hot, um, that, might, that might be a wasted effort. Um, you can, uh, when I dismantle this, I'll take the screw out take a pair of pliers and just pull it off. It will leave residue and then I go to my scraper or whatever. Um, but you, hot melt glue will be, uh, you're going to have to 
your friend for all kinds of things. Um, I guess that's it for all the talking things. Can I just say something? Uh, yeah. Uh, I was a beginner to Turner not that long ago, and you know the uh, Ellsworth and these people talk about sharpening the tool every three minutes and so on, and ending up with a where you don't need to sand. Well, I think I've become a champion sander. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know when I'm done, it looks like maybe not as good as Ellsworth, but it, it looks like it's finished smooth. So to me, I'm not the purest. Well, sand, sand paper is a cutting tool. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah and the, you don't have to be embarrassed about using sandpaper. But no, like other cutting tools, tool. sharp, dull sandpaper is right. Paint. Right. Use it as if someone else is paying for yeah. it. That's the yeah. no. <laughs> um, we're, we're at the board meeting the other night, we talked about future programs, and we uh, all agreed that we would put one together about sanding. And we want to get a representative from from Norton or Cleanspore or a big uh, a sandpaper um, distributor uh, to actually come and talk, the way they did with the Typhlon. Uh, so we will be covering that in the future. But yes, don't be afraid of sandpaper. And don't be afraid of going down to 100 grit if you have to. Uh, people who brag that they start off with uh, 320 grit after they're done with their gouge, they're probably not. And they're probably exaggerating. Do the sandpaper thing in the wintertime. What's that? Do the sandpaper thing in the wintertime. Oh, when you're here. When you're oh, here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and uh, as everything, when you're sanding, make sure you're wearing some kind of mask. Very important to wear a mask. The other thing to think about is not only how to chuck it, but how you're going to hold it on the tailstock. And there's a bunch of different live tailstocks. This is one that I use. And this is a, one of the suction cups off of my things that I used to have on top of the car, uh, the suction cups. I just use this if I want to put it against a piece and not leave any marks. And it'll spin just like anything. This one is, is good for when I'm making spindles. Uh, it doesn't leave too much of a mark, and this one's nice. I always like to leave somewhere on my mark piece, piece, even if it's a pinpoint, I want to know where my center was of that piece, because if something happens, and I sand it off, and I have to get back to that center, it's really a pain in the neck. So I always like, even just like a, it's a pinhole like that. And a lot of the times, I'll pad my stuff. They give these away. My insurance company gave me this, and I cut them up in pieces, and I use them to protect my stuff when I'm putting them in chucks. And the next one thing I'll let Russ talk about is, is that, I, that I didn't talk about is jam chucks. Uh, a jam chuck is really anything that you create out of a block of wood or whatever you've got around uh, in, into which you can uh, slide the piece that you're working on tight enough for it to hold it. And I didn't bring an example of a jam chuck. Yeah, you center is a jam chuck. Yeah, that is, uh, although it needs pressure from both sides. If you, if you had something uh, that you wanted to turn and you could turn the inside of this so something fit into it exactly and tightly so you didn't need tailstock pressure, that would be a jam chuck. So you're going to do all kinds of things where you'll have to make it. You got this, and you can put that in there. Uh, in a chuck and you can make okay. a um, There will be many times when you want to do, want to do that. Well, and you could use the ball. And you, you make them and you may even just throw it away afterwards. Although, don't ever do that. You've got to save everything. And, and eventually have a nice big bonfire. <laughs> And you could make something like that to hold it. Or if you wanted to, if you had a bowl that had an inside tenon on it, you could put that on here. Uh, matter of fact, it might be even able to do that. 
I don't know if it's going to be big enough to put the tenon on there. That can go on there. I tighten that up. Now I could spin that. If this wasn't perfectly round or if it didn't match the top, I could spin that and not worry about it coming flying off or I could sand it and refinish if I didn't like the finish. But that's a jam stuff. Um, so we've um, bored you with a lot of uh, information that some of, if you're just starting out, you're going to want to get a scroll chuck if you don't have one already. And this is going you'll use for 99% of your work to start with. So get this one, get this first, and then as needed, uh, make these homemade chucks or go out and buy other ones, uh, the hot melt blue ones, uh, whatever it is, um, to um, only buy it when you need it. Almost every lathe comes with, a pa oh, I guess I didn't talk about this, Charlie did with his uh, paper glue joint. Uh, this is the way I do all of my bowls, my, my segmented bowls. Uh, and I just glue a waste block right on the bottom here and uh, rather than doing a paper joint because I have had them fail, particularly if I set the bowl aside and pick it up six months later, it can dry out just enough to have a glue joint failure. So I just glue it on, you cut it off with a parting tool afterwards. But almost every lathe comes with at least one faceplate. And um, so this is very handy for, for uh, using. And in terms of accuracy, uh, if you want to put a piece back on the lathe, particularly a segmented piece, where you've just got a little bit of fine um, tool work left to do, it is going to be centered. If you use a scroll chuck and you put it back on, for the reasons that Bill mentioned, the tenon's going to go slightly out of round. Uh, it is the most accurate way to get the thing spinning true again and be perfectly concentric. So you should have a face plate too. And they come in different sizes. There's a larger one. They, they, I mean, you can get them up to, you know, eight inches if you, if you need be. Uh, going back to sharpening for one second, there's three uh, sources that you might want to copy down if you want more information on it. One is cartersandson.com, who makes a tool maker. Carter and Sons make uh, get, uh, lathe tools. The other one is, uh, I got a patch on my arm, Doug Thompson, Thompson Tool, ThompsonLatheTools.com. And David Ellsworth, just type in his name and go to his web website. And different, uh, Lyle Jameson has something on it. And different turners have different uh, degrees that they use the thing. Most of them are on, on here, uh, on, on your sheet that I gave you. Um, I, one of my things that I like a lot, you'll see an Irish grind on here. The Irish grind is pretty close. David Ellsworth grind, and I happen to like David's Ellsworth grind, which is a 60 degree angle, and I would say 75% of the time I use that grind on my bowl gouges and my uh, spindle gouges. Um, I don't use that for my detail gouges. Um, we had a guy by the name of uh, my, um, Mark Soleil, and we had a demonstration on finials, and he took all our 3-8 gouges, and I think Russ was there even, uh, and we reground them completely different. Completely, this is, this is a handmade grind, but it's because when you make finials, you have to get into real tight spaces, and they have to be super sharp. So that's why I don't go with an angle, I go by eye how it looks. There's no heel on this. You're not really following a bevel when you, when you, when you use a detail gouge and making finials because so, there's nothing there to, for the bevel to ride on. It's that one sharp edge that you're using. So there's all different ways of grabbing your wood. Uh, I started out not knowing any and now I know over 30 different ways to hold wood on my lathe and now you do too. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. How do you, you, I saw your straw demonstration, it makes a lot of sense, but how do you know which way to go? Or you just... Okay, the, uh, when you're getting an, an, an end grain, on, on the sides it's not as bad, but when you get to the bottom, it's tough because 
the end grate is staring right at you. So what you use... Do you want to step one up and show them? Well, what, hold on, I want to show them. Do you, you have the bottom feeder? Yeah. Is this it? Okay. There's a tool that, I, that I, it took me a long time before I realized how important it is. I use a bottom feeder, and it's ground completely different. And you'll see, once you see this, you'll understand why this tool works so great. Bottom feeder. It's not for side grain. It's not for coming down or the outside or the inside. It's basically only for one thing is cutting the bottom part of the bowl. And the you can see why it works. Yeah. Uh, that's other than that, start with the 80 grit Syrian paper and work your way down. <laughs> Well, the other thing you could do, and it's, it's worth it, you might have to do it more than once or twice, take a sponge with water, soak it up. Wet grain cuts like butter. And you don't want to have, you don't want it to, you want it wet. You don't want it, you don't want the outside, you just want that little piece that you're cutting on the bottom wet. And if you wet it with water, don't look like, like mineral, uh, spirits. Um, you don't want anything that's going to change the, how you're going to finish it. So water works really, and you have to wait for it to dry when you're done. That's another trick that somebody showed me once uh, with the sponge and just wet it, and the fibers won't pull. They, when they're wet, the fibers won't do this. They're too soft. They'll just cut. The guy that showed me this with the straws changed my life. The way I did things. Um, if you were taking a class from me and several of you in the room have, uh, and you came to me and said, I can only afford to buy one tool, uh, what would it be? And my answer would be a half inch bowl gouge. You can do virtually everything with this. Bob Stocksdale, which is a name that some of you, particularly you older ones, may remember, he was a pioneer. Uh, Turner around long before the AAW existed. He made beautiful bowls, very simple. He used all kinds of wood uh, to do it. He made them very thin, very small bases, and he got to be known uh, really around the country as uh, one of the pr premier wood turners in a period when wood turners were pretty, uh, pretty much unknown. Uh, so he, his fame was within the wood turning um, school. He famously said, uh, when asked, how did you make that half-inch bowl gouge? How did you do this one, Bob? Half-inch bowl gouge. It was the only tool he ever had. He probably had a few others as he progressed through his career. If you said, I can only afford two tools, uh, what, would, uh, what would I recommend? A half-inch bowl gouge and a half-inch spindle gouge. These two tools, you can do virtually everything. And then, uh, if you said you can afford to buy three, I would say get a parting tool because this is you're going to find uh, will come in handy for doing all kinds of things, not just making tenons, uh, but doing little detaily things, making grooves, you name it. Uh, I, I use my parting tools for all kinds of things. Uh, but the, really, the heart of your of your um, tool rack should be your bowl gouges, and we'll go into that a little bit now and how they work, how the different grinds work. Uh, and the pros and cons. Well, there aren't any cons here. Really. Janice? What about the angle? Uh, if you got one tool and it was the half inch, what angle do you show? Okay, it to we're going to talk about that. Uh, if you were to go to. Uh, I'm to get my sharpie so I can talk uh, the pictures as well. Tell you. You can get a sleep. Uh, if, if you went on YouTube and uh, uh, just typed in uh, bowl, um, wood turning bowl gouge grinds, you'd get a hundred different uh, videos and they would all claim that theirs is the best. Uh, the, the most basic one is first of all they talk about the bevel grind and that is the angle from here. Uh, the, the uh, long side of the tool uh, up the uh, bevel. And typically, we grind our tools at about 50, between 50 and 60 degrees. And someone said, uh, oh, well, don't you need to be really precise? No, 
what you need to do is set up your grinder so you're repeating, and every tool is ground the same, and when you grind your tool a week from now, it is still the same. Uh, in the class we had last week, somebody asked me, what, do you grind your, what angle do you grind your tools? And I had to admit I didn't have any idea. They said, I've just been doing it this way for 20 years. Uh, and so I got an angle finder. I didn't even own one. And it turned out I've been grinding mine at about 55, 57 degrees. Uh, it's just what you're comfortable with. Because every time you pick up a tool and you go to your, your um, workpiece, uh, your muscle memory uh, is going to tell you how to hold that. And uh, as you know, all your control and support is uh, rubbing the bevel. You're going to go to that. And you won't have to make any mental or actual cognitive uh, adjustments to accommodate a different angle. It'll be the same every time. So the two important things are consistency and then always with a sharp tool. But on these, uh, this angle here, and, uh, going up to the bevel is about 55 degrees. You will hear a lot or see a lot of videos about 4040, made famous by Stuart Batty. Uh, and he will give you all kinds of reasons why he likes his. There is nothing wrong with it. Again, whatever, if you, whatever one you choose, uh, be, stick with it and, and um, use it consistently. Um, I talked to Frank about this uh, this morning, and I, I said we're going to be talking about bevel angles. Um, should I make, recommend one over another? He said, and he asked me what I use, and I said about uh, 55 degrees. He said that's perfect. Uh, it's the most all-purpose grinder is. The other number that you will hear uh, in, in terms of uh, grinding, you, uh, the handout that Charlie gave you shows different uh, angles for the wings. Uh, the Stuart Batty, he uses a 40-40, so uh, what that is, it's not the angle of the bevel, that's the first 40. The second 40 is the angle of the wing, and that's 40 degrees uh, as well. Uh, and this is something that he's uh, come to love over the years. He teaches it in his classes, and if you can understand his Irish brogue, uh, uh, you'll, you can get a lot out of one of his uh, demos. Uh, he's a very good teacher, but he does have a very thick uh, Irish accent. Um, but. I grind all mine. This isn't a full Ellsworth grind, and I don't know what this angle is. Again, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just that I grind them all the same. And uh, uh, that way, every time you pick up that tool, it's going to feel the same as the last time you picked it up. And it doesn't matter whether it's um, uh, a 3 8 inch, inch gouge, or a half inch, or a 5 8 um, I'll speak briefly about that. If you're buying this tool in England, uh, this is a 3 8 gouge because they measure from here to here, whereas in this country we measure the diameter of the tool steel that was used to make, make the gouge. So just remember that if you happen to be ordering from an English company, you're not likely to. All the catalogs in the U.S. and all the websites use American um, uh, labeling for their, for their tools. Um, I have, yeah, I'm going to hold these up and you'll see the other thing that's different about tools. If I hold them this way up, disregard the tips and where they're ground, but what do you see that's different? The grooves in the middle. The tools that have very little grooves. When you sharpen them, they'll have very small wings on the sides. The tools that have deep grooves, when you sharpen them, will have big grooves on the side. I happen to like that groove because when I do a full cut, it gives me a nice long cut, where the smaller ones, it dulls very quickly. But each one of them has its advantages. But you'll see that. You can go to Thompson, and, or you can go to uh, uh, Carter and Sons. They'll, they'll, they'll make a 3-8 bowl gouge with three different types of flutes in it. This is called the flute. And they'll have three different types of flutes. And it happens to be that when you sharpen them, it happens to be what happens to the edges. The one thing we were asked to talk about, and 
I have them, I use them, but it's not my favorite tools. Uh, I use them in hollowing mostly, but I'm not a fan of carbide tools. Um, I think, especially for a beginner, they're too, um, what's the expression? They're, they're too aggressive, they're, they're too very, aggressive. Very and they're small, even though they're small. I think Russ has one here. They do a great job. They're super sharp. Uh, and here's a bigger one. But if you push slightly too much, you're going to carve out a notch that you'll never be able to sand out. I'm not a fan. When you're first learning, I like regular standard tools. Uh, for finishing and light touches, don't, I would never use a tool like this. I would always use it on an angle like this because this way it bites. And when it bites, it's bad. I'm not a big fan of them, but on, on some of my hollowing tools, um, I, they, they are carbide, but they're a special tool. I should have brought them. I, I have a, a tool that's called an Al Basham hollowing tool. And it's, it's got a carbide tip here, but it's got an arm coming off this way. And here's the handle. They don't make them anymore because he passed away. But what, this lays, this, this, this arm lays on the tool rest. And instead of holding it, you hold it this way, and you just put your hand across it very lightly. And it doesn't, it doesn't, it won't flip up because you've got the tool rest underneath it. It's not going to go, it vibrates very little. They're expensive if you can find them, but that's a carbide tool that I do like, but I am not a big fan of carbide tools. Um, one of the areas where I do like carbide, well, if you're hollowing, which is really subject for a whole other demo, obviously, uh, most hollowing systems do use uh, carbide because it's very hard to get on a bevel down inside a deep piece. You, you just can't do it. So the carbide comes in handy. Um, when I make a, a larger bowl, well, let's do God in a second. Um, I like to have my rim a little bit curved and then slightly undercut like that. The other way, when you make a larger bowl, you, and you typically pick up a salad bowl like this and use your thumb. And you need a way to grab that bowl. If it's full of salad, you need to be able to get a little bit better grip on it. So if you do an undercut like this, uh, um, I use the carbide tool to make this little undercut. If you're getting in here with even a 3 8 bowl gouge, or, or you couldn't do it with a spindle gouge, you'd have a wicked catch. Um, th that's when a carbide comes in handy for doing a little detail thing like that. Uh, if you don't want to do the undercut, I think it gives a ball a nice feel. It, it's kind of ergonomic. If you don't want to do that, the other way on a larger piece is that you can just make the, the rim a little fatter and then come back in like that. That gives you another way to grab your ball. You would do that with a gouge. You wouldn't use carbide. Uh, but that's, that's one use. Uh, I also make Travel mugs. Uh, Alan, want to hold up that mug down on the floor? I do all the hollowing in my travel mugs like that uh, with uh, a mom. <laughs> with your that's what, that's why I'm a judge in My That one leaks. <laughs> yeah, well, the newer, improved models don't leak. <laughs> uh, I use a carbide hollowing tool to, to do that, too. Um, all right, I think that covers it on carbide. We're really not going to talk too much uh, more about that. We'll really go to the basics on the bowl gouge, and really that's your primary tool. What is it? Quarter of nine. Quarter of nine. Oh, we're over time already. Um, uh, all right, um, I guess we should wind it up. I didn't realize we were being so long-winded. Uh, but I hope we've given you kind of an overview. Maybe we spend a little too much time on the chucking methods. Definitely get a scroll chuck. Uh, and definitely um, 
get um, the bowl gouge if you're just starting your shop. Uh, that's a good place to start. Then, good night, Alan. And you're going to take care of the Okay. Um, one shot that I didn't tell you about, and uh, you make it yourself. If you want to see the, the plans for it, Mike Peace, if you go to Mike Peace wood turning, you'll see it. He makes chess pieces out of, on a wood turn. And the way he chucks them is he makes a piece of wood very similar to one of these pieces that have a thread on it, you know, like this. But he threads a piece and he drills a hole in the center. Now this screws, screws onto this part of the lathe and it's got a hole in the center. He makes a 5 8 stub on the piece of wood. Then he takes a Forstner bit on a piece of chest set and he builds a, does a 5 8 hole on that. Then he takes a, a sheet metal screw and he goes from here into the center of here and that holds his chest piece while he turns it. This sounded like this was a castle in a chest set. Well, that's what it would look like when it was on the lathe and he turned it. It would be a block of wood that he turned it. And then he takes the screw out after he's done finishing it and he just puts a piece of felt over the bottom of it. You don't realize that there was a hole ever there. That's a, a homemade chuck to make the chess pieces. He has all his plans, my piece, on the internet and you can make, you, he, you can actually download them and make the chess set. And it's kind of a cool little project. I, uh, uh, any question about any of the chucks that we, that we have laid out here? Well, I have a quick question on uh, one of the tools on your bottom. Okay. Tool. Do you have to hand sharpen that? Yes. That won't go in any jig. That's not going to go in a jig. That has to be hand sharpened. And it's like an 85 degree angle. It's, it's, pr it's pretty sh steep. But you, that's the only thing you can use it for. You can't use it for the outside or anything like that. It's, it's, it's not, it'll bounce too much. And, and do you know what, what tool that started out as? Uh, that, well, <laughs> it, it might have started out as, as a 5 8 bowl gouge, or it might have... It's got a really shallow... It's got a, yeah, it's uh, a shallow uh, flute. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they really sell them as bottom feeders. That's, yeah, that's how yeah, they're you, listed. You can buy yeah. bottom feeders now. Yeah, you can buy but, bottom but, bottom Technically, the term bottom feeder really is a grind, not a tool, but it becomes a, tool, a spe specific tool for really one purpose. How much does the beginner ones uh, range from? Like, I mean, beginner, so how much would a range one, a beginner range uh, tool? Uh, you mean uh, in terms of cost? Yes. Oh, boy. They're all over the place. Oh, yeah. You can go to Penn State Industries and buy very basic tools but you're not going to get a real quality tool. I mean, like a good tool. A, a good tool, plan on spending $100. Okay. Um, the one that we're... Um, 100 and a half. Yeah. yeah, and that's just for the iron, for the steel. Off. This is a Fronson 5-8 lathe tool, 5 8 inch bow gouge. It says $100 on it. With no handle. handle. With no handle. <laughs> so, but, but just buy the one, the, the best one you can afford. Some of the names that, that are, are decent standard tools, Robert Sorby makes decent standard tools. They're not the top, but they're in the middle. Okay. Uh, stay away from Harbor Freight tools. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I got a brother. Uh, stay away from that tools for wood turning. I got a brother and he told me that. <laughs> If you go to uh, craft stores, or, uh, like uh, Woodcraft yeah. sells all different types, but if you go to some of the shows that are around, there was a couple of uh, a couple of months ago. There was one in Put the Gorder. They'll have tool vendors there, okay. and that's actually the best time to buy because they'll give you the best deals. Right. Right. Uh, can, oh, yeah. can we have some kind of a uh, place on our website where we put when all these shows are going to be around the area because I didn't know anything about the Punta Gorda and I found out about the yeah. thing in uh, Orlando like the week before and I couldn't make plans. Oh, absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Yes. If anybody finds out about it, they can just, you know, let, let, let somebody yes. you know, The other thing from the, uh, the, the club member, the, the, the board 
members are required, and I believe it's in our bylaws, that they have to be members of the AAW. That's why I joined. And the, the other thing that's nice about it, we get benefits from the <laughs> AAW the more members we have. The biggest one is, and, I, and I, I can tell you from my club in Long Island, uh, the more members you have, you get certain perks. Like they had a, a raffle of AAW clubs to win a lathe. My club in Long Island won the lathe. But they also have things, and I enter it every year, uh, free tuition to one of the AAW schools in Campbell, and I'm trying to think where the other one is. Aramont. 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 Yeah. And the tuition is paid for free if you're a winner, but you have to be a member of the AAW. We have had members in our club win that. I'm not one of the fortunate ones, though, but, but I enter it every year. And uh, it's a week-long thing where the classes are free. You just have to pay your own room and board and get there. Uh, and from what people that I've known that have went there, said that when they came back, they were a completely different term. And I could tell you that, that I could see how that happened by me going to the Florida Symposium. When I came back, I was a different person. I took lessons in airbrushing. Uh -huh. Stan was there. Uh -huh. and, and wasn't it great? Yeah, fabulous. And some, they have some of the best wood turners in the world there. Yeah. I mean, it, it was amazing. Three days of of just sure pleasure, learning, and fun, and it was absolutely great. Um, like the symposium, like the AEW symposium? Yes, but th that's even bigger. Yeah, that's even yeah. bigger than, uh, than this one is. But if, uh, next year, and I think it was in February, I think it was. I think it's going to be in February again next year, but when it comes up, uh, we'll, we'll get it into the newsletter and stuff like that. Um, but uh, just remember, for people at the beginning, I sat right where you were 12 years ago. Not on this side of the lake, on that side of the lake. So Wait, you were a little overwhelmed? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was... It's been, it, 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 it's okay. Such, <laughs> thanks to the members, it became such a wonderful, wonderful okay. journey. I really mean that. Thank you.